Diabetes is a condition when person has a sustained high blood glucose level. But diabetes has four major subtypes, and type 2 diabetes is the most common of them. Type 2 diabetes is characterized by dysregulation of the metabolism, and dysregulation of the metabolism is caused by two major factors. It's impaired insulin secretion and insulin resistance. Type 2 diabetes is the most common type of diabetes, accounting for more than 80% of all diabetes cases. Initially, prediabetes develops. It's a condition when person has blood glucose level higher than normal, but not high enough to make a diagnosis of diabetes. So, obviously, this person has a certain metabolic abnormalities, and such person has higher risk of further glucose elevation compared to other people. And then with time, glucose will reach diabetic threshold, and at this moment it will be diabetes. The annual conversion rates of prediabetes to diabetes range from 3% to 11%. So roughly out of 100 patients with prediabetes, seven individuals will progress to diabetes. Important that at the time of diagnosis, many patients with type 2 diabetes do not have symptoms. But if symptoms develop, usually it's a severe hyperglycemia, or in rare cases it can be diabetic ketoacidosis. And to explain why the symptoms develop, we have to know the pathogenesis. Before the pathogenesis, we have to know that the major factor that will determine will diabetes type 2 develop or not is increasing adipose tissue mass. On this graph, we see that people with the highest body mass index have the highest risk of diabetes. And in general, body mass index higher than 25 is considered as a risk factor of diabetes type 2. Additional factor that can predispose to diabetes type 2 is physical inactivity and cigarette smoking. And very important that the risk of diabetes type 2 increase with age. So, screening of diabetes type 2 should begin no later than at 35 for all people. There are three factors in pathogenesis of diabetes type 2. First of all, it's a genetic factor. The presence of a certain genes can increase the risk of diabetes type 2 in 2 or 3 times, but in some cases the risk can increase in 30 times. It is believed that genetic predisposition is caused by a most common mutation, which is single nucleotide polymorphism, and this mutation causes alterations in TCF7L2 gene. Genetic factor we cannot control but important that genetic factor is not very strong. It can increase the risk only by 10 to 20 percent. So even if person has some genetic predisposition to diabetes, he is not doomed, because the majority of non-diabetic patients carry risk variants. Still, the major factor that will determine will diabetes develop or not is the severity of obesity. The second factor in pathogenesis of diabetes is beta cell function. It's not the major factor, but the functional capacity of beta cells will determine when glucose level will begin to increase and when symptoms will begin to appear. And the third factor, and the most important one, is insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is caused by a combination of obesity physical inactivity and genetic predisposition. Insulin resistance precedes diabetes type 2 by many years, and when beta cells will not be able to compensate insulin resistance by increasing insulin secretion, glucose level will increase and symptoms will begin to appear. Nowadays, we know that insulin resistance in obesity affects PI3K pathway. On this image, we can see an overview of diabetes type 2 pathogenesis. As we see, PI3K pathway is the end point in the pathogenic cascade. But the factors that cause these pathogenic alterations is enlargement of adipocytes, 
Exactly increasing fat tissue mass will cause disruption of PI3K pathway. So let's explain the pathogenesis of diabetes type 2 step by step. So here we have tissues. Let's take muscle tissue for example. And there is pancreas. And pancreas has a lot of beta cells that produce insulin. Insulin in the blood binds to insulin receptor and tissues. With binding, insulin activates insulin receptor substrate, which is a part of insulin pathway. Activation of insulin pathway eventually leads to activation of PI3K pathway, which determines the insulin effect on tissues. Why do tissues need insulin? Tissues have glute transporter, and in the blood we have a lot of glucose. And as we know, glucose is a fuel for tissues. So, glute transporter provides the transportation of glucose from the blood into the tissues. But glute transporter by itself is very slow. Let's suppose that glute transporter provides uptake of two glucose molecules from the blood and transports them into the tissues. Insulin effect on tissues can markedly increase the speed of glute transportation. And with insulin stimulation, glute transporter can deliver additional 7 glucose molecules into the tissue. So, as we see, insulin effect determines the amount of glucose molecules that income to the tissues. And at the same time, insulin effect determines the amount of glucose in the blood. In addition to this, we have to know that glucose level in the blood is also maintained by liver production of glucose and by kidneys reabsorption of glucose. And all these factors help us to maintain normal blood glucose level. But also, we have substantial amount of adipose tissue in our organism. And adipose tissue can release into the blood pro-inflammatory cytokines as tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-6 or resistin. And also, adipose tissue can release a lot of free fatty acids. Tissues have tumor necrosis factor receptor and toll-like receptor 4. Pro-inflammatory cytokines and free fatty acids can bind to these receptors. And with binding, they can activate various pro-inflammatory pathways. In addition to this, free fatty acids can diffuse into the tissues where they undergo lipolysis with formation of DSL glycerol. And accumulation of DSL glycerol inside the tissues can activate nuclear protein kinase C. Activation of nuclear protein kinase C causes inhibition of insulin receptor sensitivity and also it inhibits intracellular insulin pathway. And this inhibition of insulin effect provides counterbalance to insulin effect on tissues so it also helps to maintain normal blood glucose level. The problems begin when the amount of fat tissue increases. In some people, the mass of adipose tissue becomes huge, and we call this state obesity. In a obese individual with increase in adipose tissue, the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines and free fatty acids increase. This causes increase in stimulation of pro-inflammatory pathways and also, this causes increase in DSL glycerols. Together, overactivation of pro-inflammatory pathways and accumulation of DSL glycerols cause overstimulation of protein kinase C. Overactivation of protein kinase C causes overinhibition of insulin receptor sensitivity and insulin intracellular pathway. Altogether, this causes significant decrease in insulin intracellular effect. With decreasing insulin effect, the insulin stimulation of glute transporter decreases. So now glute transporter will transport 4 glucose molecules less. As a result, the amount of glucose molecules in the blood increases, but the amount of glucose molecules in the tissue decreases. So now in the tissues will be 4 glucose molecules less, but in the blood there will be 4 extra glucose molecules. In response to four extra glucose molecules, pancreatic beta cells will increase insulin secretion. So, in response to insulin resistance, beta cells 
are trying to produce more insulin molecules to overcome insulin resistance by increasing total insulin concentration. And at this point, blood glucose level will be normal, simply because extra insulin helps to utilize extra glucose. With time, dysfunction of beta cells develop, because nobody can work at his limits all the time. So, at some point of time, beta cells will be no longer capable to produce so much insulin. And without these additional insulin molecules, organism is no longer capable to overcome insulin resistance. As a result, insulin effect on tissues will decrease, and thereby these four extra glucose molecules will stay in the blood. So, in the end, person will have increased blood glucose level and decrease in glucose income to the tissues. Why blood glucose level is so important? Because elevated blood glucose level is the major criteria of diabetes. In order to make a diagnosis diabetes, we need to determine elevated blood glucose level, simple as that. And elevation of blood glucose level we determine based on three major tests. First of all, it's a fasting plasma glucose level which in case of diabetes should be higher than 126 mg or 7 millimoles. The second test is glucose tolerance test, or we call it the 2-hour plasma glucose level. And in case of diabetes, glucose level should be higher than 200 or 11.1 millimoles. And the third test is glycated hemoglobin. In case of diabetes, glycated hemoglobin should be higher than 6.5. But if person has classical symptoms of hyperglycemia and his blood glucose level is above 11.1 millimoles, it also will be enough to make a diagnosis of diabetes. So, if person has classical symptoms and his blood glucose level is above 11.1, it's diabetes. But if person do not have prominent clinical symptoms, to make a diagnosis of diabetes, we need to determine abnormal blood glucose level on two consecutive tests. What do we mean by this? If we determine abnormal glycated hemoglobin, for example, 7%, which is above 6.5, so maybe it's diabetes. In this case, we should perform a second glycated hemoglobin test. And if this test will be abnormal, 6.8% for example, which is about 6.5, two consecutive abnormal tests will confirm the diagnosis of diabetes. The second scenario is the case when one test is about diagnostic margins and the second one is not. In this case, we should repeat the test which is about diagnostic margins. So let's suppose that fasting plasma glucose level is about diagnostic cut point, but oral glucose tolerance test is not high enough. In this case, we do not care about glucose tolerance test. We should repeat the abnormal test, which is fasting plasma glucose. And if the second time the result is abnormal, we confirm the diagnosis of diabetes. Important that we need to know plasma glucose level not only to confirm the diagnosis, but also it's important in management of patient, because some anti-diabetic drugs have more potent glucose lowering effect than other. To confirm the diagnosis, we need to determine abnormal glucose test two consecutive times. And if one test is abnormal on two consecutive times, and the other is normal, we do not care about normal, it still will be enough to make a diagnosis of diabetes. And if person have test results near the diagnostic threshold, for example, glycated hemoglobin is 6.2, and the diabetes criteria is above 6.5, in this case, we should repeat the test in 3 to 6 months. The reason why we do care so much about blood glucose level is that continuously elevated blood glucose level can cause some serious clinical symptoms. So, what is the mechanism of clinical symptoms? First of all, diabetes causes elevated blood glucose level. With increase in blood glucose, glucose excretion increases, and we excrete glucose by the urine. 
increase in glucose level in the urine we call glucosuria. Glucose is osmotically active substance, which means that glucose will cause increase in osmotic pressure in the urine. Because water moves by osmotic gradient, this will cause increase in water excretion, and increase in diuresis we call polyuria. With increase in excretion of water, organism should increase water consumption, so patient will drink more water, and this state we call polydipsia. But the major danger of elevated blood glucose level is the ability of glucose to cause non-enzymatic glycation of proteins, including proteins on blood vessels, and eventually this will cause atherosclerosis of the blood vessels. Atherosclerosis in kidneys will cause diabetic nephropathy. In the heart, it will cause coronary artery disease. In the brain, it will increase the risk of stroke. In the nerves, it will cause diabetic neuropathy. In the retina, it will cause diabetic retinopathy. And in the peripheral blood vessels, it will cause peripheral artery disease. Exactly atherosclerosis-related injury we consider as the major complication of diabetes. But the second component of diabetes is decreasing amount of glucose in the tissues. Without sufficient income of glucose, which serves as fuel for tissues, energy production decreases. So tissues will be in energy deficient state. In response to this, tissues will activate lipolysis, which is degradation of adipose tissue. First of all, it will cause weight loss, but also, with decreasing amount of fat tissue, the secretion of leptin decreases, and decreasing leptin stimulates food consumption, and increasing food consumption we call polyphagia. Lipolysis results in massive release of free fatty acids. From fatty acids we make ketone bodies, which have very similar properties to glucose. So, organism tries to compensate decrease in glucose level by increasing ketone bodies production, and increasing ketone bodies will cause diabetic ketoacidosis. On this image, we can see an overview of all factors that contribute to hyperglycemia. In case of diabetes type 2, as we already know, pro-inflammatory state which is caused by fat tissue plays crucial part. Also, we can see there are medications that can decrease blood glucose level. And treatment of diabetes we will discuss in the next video.